Okay, so first thing I want to say is I didn't have, well, I had plenty of time to deal with this, but my computer erased the original, and so I had to kind of rewrite this thing on the fly. So chances are it's going to be a little bit rough. Eh, I will do my best with what I've got here. The second I want to say is this is just a survey. It's not going to be extravagantly deep. Um, we're just doing a flyby. We're just kind of moseying on in a balloon through this thing. So if you want the miner's view, where we dig in super, super deep, and we start pulling out diamonds and gold and all the other cool stuff, pray that somebody starts preaching through it in the server, like Jameis, maybe. That would be cool. So if you guys have your Bibles with you, open to the book of Judas, please. Yeah, Judas. Where, where does your mind immediately go? We just got interrupted, and this guy immediately recognizes what's being said. You know what book, you know what book we're in. We're in the book of Jude. But you cringed at the thought of the book of Judas. Why? Because of our biblical connection to that name. We know who he is, and we know what Judas did. He's the betrayer of our Lord. This was absolutely no different for the first century Christians. Judas was a very common name at that time, like Jesus was. But out of respect for who Christ is, the name quickly stopped being used. As I'm sure you can imagine, Judas fell out of popularity rather quickly, almost immediately, in the Christian communities for a totally different reason. It's not hard to understand why every little Judas in the church was suddenly going by the shortened name Jude. No one wanted to be connected to the prophesied son of perdition of Psalm 109. So we know who our Judas, our Judah, our Jude is not. So who is he? Well, we have a few options. He is either some guy that also just happens to be a leader in the early church, or the apostle of Jesus, or the half-brother of Jesus. Church tradition and the letter itself support the idea that this is the brother of James, the half-brother of Jesus. Had he been an apostle, he most likely would have identified himself as such, specifically considering the intensity and subject matter of the epistle. Also, as we will see later, he referred to the apostles in verse 17 in such a way as to suggest he was not one of them. Jude the Apostle was not the brother of James, but the son of James, as we see in Luke 6.16 and Acts 1.13. The brother of Jesus has strong support because he was the brother of James, who himself is also the half-brother of Jesus, James being the pastor of the church of Jerusalem. This appears to be another brother of Jesus, which, for all you apologists who deal with Catholics, Write that down. Jude, we can assume, is not wanting to have any special place based on his connection to Jesus. As it would appear, he wants to be heard by the merit of his argument and the connections he has built with whoever this is being wrote to, which we actually don't know who that is. So what's the date of our writing? That is also something we don't actually know. I've seen everything from 60 AD all the way to 80 AD. Personally, I believe it was in the 60s. Why, you ask? Great question. If I want to get information out to a large crowd of people, all I have to do right now is post it online or in a bunch of different servers or wherever, and it's going to be quickly spread by anyone who wants to hear what I have to say or just people that want to make fun of me. That's fine, too. But what did they need for something to be read, spread, and accepted time. They needed time. It was accepted rather early as scripture. Second Peter, which was most likely wrote earlier than Jude, took far more attack about its authenticity than Jude did. We even have a few early church fathers referencing it. What's super fun to play with is reading these scholars that believe that Second Peter stole lines from Jude, or that Jude stole lines from Peter. The arguments are inconsistent at best. So why do we care, though? Pastors borrow from each other all the time. In our day and age, but we've seen the controversy that comes from pastors taking from each other. We've seen the ridiculous claims that atheists make, though. 
And so that's why this is important, because at some point, you may run into men who attempt to discredit the Bible based on things like this. But the problem is, literary dependence does not undermine the truth of Scripture. If Jude was pulling from Second Peter, why is that wrong? These two men knew each other. They have most likely had conversations, and they were writing on the same topic, and it had not even been Jude's primary reason with which to reach out. Just remember to remind the men attacking Scripture that when they do so, they cannot quote anyone else's arguments to make a point about Jude quoting someone else's arguments. So, our little letter that could here has quite a few different themes going on with the overarching theme in it. We see that Jude wanted to write to them about their shared salvation, but couldn't because immoral men had come into the church causing them to do wrong or attempting to. So instead of writing about the gospel as he apparently wanted to, he felt compelled to stop and write about these false teachings and give these men something solid to stand on in the face of that. Some of what we see, we see incredibly hard lines between the attitudes towards the saints and the false teachers. We see that Jude uses triplets like gunshots. Verse 1, called, beloved, kept. Verse 2, mercy, peace, love. 5 through 7, Israel, angels who sinned, Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 11, Cain, Balaam, Korah. He uses apocalyptic literature. The reference in verse 9 may come from the Assumption of Moses, and 14 and 15 from the Book of Enoch. Mind you, this does not mean that those books are inspired literature. Non-canonical writings do contain things that are true. That Jude may quote from non-biblical sources simply means that what he is using from those sources for his inspired text is true. And as a personal note, I'd like to point out the family resemblance. Both James and Jude are incredibly direct, picturesque, and emphasize practice. Now, like any other letter, we can break this thing down and do a bunch of small bits and deal with it for six months. Or, for the simplicity of what we're doing here, just a balloon-style overview, we'll keep it simple. So we're going to deal with two major areas. Verses 1 through 16 and verses 17 through 25. So in the first section, it is stand strong. Fight back against what the enemy is doing. So fight the fight of faith, or as Judah said, contend for the faith. The second half, we will call it remember, or contend for the faith by remembering. So in the first part of the book, it has to do with contending with a certain group of people for the faith that was delivered once for all. Given to who? Who are these people? He gives us three code words to know who his audience is. It's all very mysterious, these words. And the words are called, beloved, and kept for the Lord Jesus Christ in verse 1. So these are the believers, the church, the bride, the dare I say, elect. Foreknown by God before the foundation of the world, these people receive the call of God and are kept by his hand, those who are faithfully a part of the body of Christ. The CSB says, called, loved by God the Father. So he starts with mercy, peace, and love, and then says, I wanted to write about our shared salvation, but I have to write about contending for the faith. So for those of you that hold to the idea that if we are saved, then that's good enough. Why argue about things? You're just dividing the church. As we see right here and in other epistles, contending for the faith does not include only theology regarding salvation. Wipe the foam from around your mouth. It includes here the lifestyle of license or sensuality or immorality. So in other words, when I, you, we, are standing up for biblical morality, we are contending for the faith of Jesus Christ. This letter should answer, or more appropriately, bludgeon square across the head anyone who takes issue with biblical morals crossing to the outside world, and sadly, 
in the church. To contend for the faith according to scripture is to argue against those who are perverting morality. That's part of what our call as believers is to be. And it says there was a faith handed down to the disciples. Can anyone think of a moral statement in our faith that was handed down by the apostles that's part of how we are to live? I bet a bunch of stuff comes to mind. How about 1 Thessalonians 4? This is the will of God, your sanctification, that you keep away from sexual immorality. That is a statement of our faith that is in keeping with contending for the faith. The message we have from God is not just how to be saved. It is also how to live now that you are saved. The faith we hold to, the God that has kept us, has given us more than John 3.16. We have a standard by which to live, stand, and contend. Because as believers, what we never want to be is those that do what is right in their own eyes. This is not what the apostles did, and Jude is leaving no room for that kind of thinking. He is saying it is necessary for you to contend over these sorts of things. You have to fight earnestly for the truth of the scripture that was handed down. Now, verse 4, certain bros have crept in unnoticed. Pay attention to that word unnoticed. What is he saying? You got people hiding behind the curtains, under the tables, sliding in through rafters? No. License, sensuality, immorality comes through the door in a sneaky way. The immorality ninja. What they don't do is walk in wearing a neon shirt that says false teacher holding a banner that says, I secretly worship Satan. Though that is true, that's who they are and what they are. They are sneaky and deceptive about how they slip in. So they crept in unnoticed and were marked out for this condemnation long ago. We didn't see them coming, but we have been warned. But they did not take our Lord by surprise. He was not only aware, but all things work to the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose, because this is all according to the plan of the one who works out everything in agreement with the purpose of his will. This then and now will in the end make us more Christ-like. So these ninjas, we were and are slow to notice, are described as ungodly. What is ungodly about them? Look at the second half of verse 4, and what do you see? They are turning the grace of our God into sensuality. How absolutely wicked to take something so pure clean and so good and make it this. They have denied Christ, but claimed his grace and decided what that grace is to be. They have done what they think is right in their own eyes. I'm sure no one has to think very hard to take verse four and find application in the world we live in. It's almost like this verse was wrote thinking about 2022, the sensuality, the lust, the filth, all under the guise of grace, creeping in like poison right into our pulpits, our elderships, our deaconettes, our Sunday schools, and our children's ministries. And it's okay because we have to preach grace and be graceful and show grace and be tolerant. This is what the grace of our Lord has been watered down to an improper use, an impotent version of the word tolerant. Verse 5, now I want to remind you, although you came to know these things once and for all, that Jesus saved a people out of Egypt and later destroyed those who did not believe. What's he saying? God may have started Pastor Jim's Bible-believing apostolic New Covenant First Baptist Church, but he started other works before you, and he removed them from the land of existence. No one can say, but we started with the truth. Therefore, therefore what, homie? There were people God rescued, brought out of slavery, and then fitted them for concrete shoes because of disobedience. Matthew 13 says there will be the wheat with the tares. 
people in the visible church who look like they are with us, but they aren't. They will not end up with us in eternity. They have an entirely different retirement package. The closest they get to God is coming to church on Sunday, which is a grace that none of us deserve. Now, verse 6. <laughs> so verse 6 is a lot of fun. I've seen some very interesting interpretations here. And if you hold to some of the more fun ones, I'm not making fun of you. But angels that did not keep their own domain. What's their domain? And this is where it gets super fun. So we have option, we have option one. Angels left the spiritual realm and went and knocked up some ladies and made giants, and that's why God flooded the earth. Now, Second Peter speaks of this, but Jude seems to add it, add to it a bit by connecting it with Sodom and Gomorrah. So some say that this was a revolt against God and an invasion of earth by these fallen angels. They point to Genesis 6, 1 through 4, and claim that the sons of God were fallen angels who assumed human form, cohabitated with the daughters of men, and spit out a race of giants. And God was all, nah, son, and flooded the earth. It's fun. I mean, it's, it's fun to think about, but I, I take issue with this. It's true the sons of God refer to angels, but never fallen ones. The obedient angels are called the sons of God. Think Job. The sons of God presented themselves before the throne, and then also Satan. The angels are spirit. We do see in the Old Testament angels who appeared as human, but this was not incarnation. How could a spirit being have a physical relationship with a woman? And the big one for me is Jesus himself tells us that angels are sexless, the poor things. In Matthew 20, 20, uh, 22, 30. Another thing to remember is that God sent the flood because of man, not angels. And God saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and it grieved the Lord that he had made angels? No. It grieved the Lord that he had made man. But Slay, what about the connection to Sodom and Gomorrah? I got you. I understand. Depending on your translation, Verse 7 starts with even as, or in like manner, or likewise, or something along those lines, if I didn't happen to slew out your version. So that word or phrasing gets connected back to and forward to Sodom and Gomorrah. Likewise, or in like manner. But what is the connection? Did the angels go after strange flesh? Look at it. Catch the grammatical connections. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, in like manner, are set forth for what? An example. Do we see it? Do you see it? The angels are an example of God's judgment, just like, you guessed it, Sodom and Gomorrah. So it's not about the sexual perversion of Sodom and Gomorrah, but about the example of judgment that connects the two. And while we're here, while we're on the subject, I'd just like to mention that Genesis 6-4 presents a strong argument against the angel honeymoon idea. There were giants in the earth in those days and also after. Mind you, there's a lot more argumentation to make in regard to this, but we're just doing a flyover and this doesn't have much to do with it. So no matter your understanding of how the angels got there, please do not miss the point. These angels rebelled against God, and God yoked them up by the throat, threw them into the abyss, and they are bound in darkness and reserved for judgment. Do not pass go. Do not collect a hundred angel dollars or whatever they're currency happens to be. Now, in reference to Sodom and Gomorrah, I do want to remind you of something. What did the Sodomites say? Send them to me so that I can do what I want with them. Give us the men so we can do as we wish with them. A brazen demand to sin, to do what is right in their own eyes. Now, the men who are creeping in under a tainted view of grace and sensuality are doing what? What is their message? What do they want us to, what do they want under the grace of God? 
immorality, homosexuality, fornication, adultery, witchcraft, rebellion of all stripes. I've seen the argument here made specifically about homosexuality alone, but that's based on a misunderstanding of how Sodom and Gomorrah was being used. But the key point was judgment for rebellion, all rebellion, no matter how that rebellion takes form. We have a letter right here that tells us to stand up and contend for the faith against all these things. Yet for most churches, all we are allowed to do is tolerate and love. Be graceful. Don't speak out. Don't contend for the faith. Because that's not tolerant. So now in verse 8. In the same way, these men also, relying on dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and slander the glorious ones. So in other words, they do not accept the right way. They deny God's order of things. It is going to be what they want, and that's the only possible way it can be, and they will ta- attain it in any way possible, even denying Jesus our master. A perfect example of this is gender identity. I don't like being a boy or a girl, so I'm going to be the other thing now. That's all there is to it, and you will be okay with it. And you will agree with it because you have to be tolerant and loving. We, the church, expect psychosis from the world, but the church cannot stand by and just be okay with it. This letter was wrote to us, the church, the bride of Christ. Do not forget that. Remember remember Jude wrote this letter because he needed to. Because it was an emergency, how much more then should we hear what's being said by him and ultimately our Father in heaven? We are to absolutely love them by telling them the truth. Think about it. Jude wanted to write about our common salvation, but what took precedence? The error, the false teaching, the things that lead to death. We have to show love by standing on the truth, and we have to do this with respect, gentleness, and meekness. So these things in verse 8 are biblical fixtures. God told me in a dream. No, sir. No, sir, he did not. And the next time someone tells you that, you remember this. Verse 9. Michael fights with Satan over the body of Moses. And rebukes him, not in his own authority, but that of the Lord. So Deuteronomy 34 is the passage. Moses dies, and we see that they are fighting over the body of Moses. No doubt God hid the body because Israel, being Israel, would have fallen into just countless amounts of idolatry over the body of Moses. But what we see directly is that even Michael was not disrespectful to Satan. Not because of Satan, but because of God. He didn't claim authority. He claimed the Lord's authority over the sinful one, which is an example of what we need to do. In contending for the faith, it needs to be done not in our own authority, but in the Lord's authority, in the Lord's rebuke. Rebuke means to admonish. Tell them they are wrong. To turn them back. That last bit, to turn them back, I think we tend to forget that part. We rebuke and we walk around like we want to fight instead of doing it with grace and humility and gentle leadership to the truth. I'm guilty of this, and I'd say most of us are. But within the church, we need it. Are you stealing? Stop. Are you sleeping with someone outside of marriage or your own marriage? Stop. Are you in a same-sex relationship? Stop. Do you worship trees sitting around in a rock garden contemplating your navel? Stop. Church, we cannot let the standard be changed. We tell them to stop with the authority of the Lord. We rebuke what they are doing, not based on us, but on Christ. And then verse 10 says, These people blaspheme 
anything they do not understand. So hold on. Stop everything you're doing. Underline that. Put a smiley face to it or an asterisk or whatever you do to remember something important in Scripture. They aren't against God's authority because they understand it. They are against it because they do not understand it. Why? Because they know how they feel. These are not sola scriptura people. Things they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals, by these things, they are being destroyed. You see it? These people are doing what they feel instinctively rather than what they are told to do by the word of God. Think to the world we live in, in the quote-unquote church today. Sound familiar, guys? And then he says, tolerate them, embrace them, have fellowship with them? No. He says, woe to them. They have gone the way of Cain. The way of Cain, or religion without faith. Self-righteousness, of character, and good works. And we see, we know how that ends. They have plunged into Balaam's error for profit. People speaking on behalf of the church, afraid of losing their paycheck or losing the, or, or using the church to get rich. Or another way to say it, you guys might recognize, they are paid to speak to itching ears. A profit for hire. They purposefully say whatever is needed to keep support and popularity to get themselves a paycheck and have perished in Korah's rebellion. Anyone remember this one? Why is Moses in charge? Moses is stupid. So they stood out against God's appointed earthly authority and God swallowed them up like the California coastline ought to be. Look at verse 12. These men are dangerous reefs at your love feast. A little rhyme. In other words, they are part of your church operation, but they are hiding. They are continuing to feast with you without fear. Ultimately, they do, they, they do not have reverence for God, nor do they fear him. Shepherds who only look after themselves, only caring for their own desires. Clouds without water, they look like something promising, but can provide nothing. As Proverbs 25, 14 states, the one who boasts about a gift that does not exist is like clouds and wind without rain. Carried along by the winds, they're determining direction based on which way the wind is blowing, meaning based on how they feel. Autumn trees without fruit. And how can we know someone? By their fruits. Matthew 7, 16. And then we have this. Fruitless, twice dead, and uprooted. Think Psalm 1. They are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shameful deeds, wandering stars for whom the blackness of darkness is reserved forever. The wandering star or the shooting star. Bright for a moment, then burns out, never to be seen again. And we have a common theme with this. If you look to Revelation 9, we see Satan is called something very similar. As you consider the list and the words of the Lord used to describe false teachers and what it is they teach, does it ever, ever sound okay to eat the meat and spit out the bones of a false teacher. A broken clock is right twice a day, but not a false teacher. We should not stand for any false teachers. Give them any room to make their case. And when you are told to use grace, remember the list and the command to contend for the faith, and by all means use grace, just not their version of it. That Jude had to stop and write a letter because there is a dark 
force involved in the church. We do not get to rewrite God's word because we may be sympathetic to the cause or how they feel. Why? Because it is death. It kills. False teaching is heroin. It is literally Hitler. We cannot roll over. We cannot allow thuggery to get into the church, no matter the guise by which it enters. Now look at 14. And Enoch, in the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied about them. Look, the Lord comes with thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict them of all their ungodly acts that they have done in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things ungodly sinners have said against him. So first, that is a super awkward sentence. But these ungodly people doing ungodly deeds in an ungodly way, it sounds an awful lot like these are ungodly people. They're not believers, he continues. And concerning all the harsh things ungodly sinners have said against him. This is another stop moment. Look, what did he just say? God is going to execute massive judgment, which should not be a surprise considering what is reserved for them, the blackness of darkness. But the end is what should pop you right in the mouth. They walk around shaking their fists at the sky, claiming God doesn't have the right. Why? Because they do not understand. Remember? But you and I, we know God does have the right entirely and completely. And if we do not tell them, then we have not listened to Jude. Now, these are discontented grumblers. This is a think moment. We have seen this in scripture elsewhere about the church. Grumbling has harsh judgment that comes with it. 1 Corinthians 10.10, 10, nor grumble as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. James 5, 9. Do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. In Philippians 2, 14, a direct imperative, do all things without grumbling or disputing. And then we go back to Jude's description. These people who are Thumbing up grumbling against purity and holiness, finding fault with the church. What are they doing? Following after their own desires. They use arrogant words, flattering people for their own advantage. I think this is so Windex crystal clean clear that we can not only think of people maybe in our own churches, but maybe convictingly times we have been this. Look at social media. I bet that opens a slew of mental tabs that fit this category. In this instance, I would not just say contend for the faith against them and the arrogant grumblers, but contend for the faith in your own mind, in your own life. Do you rumble? Are you contending against being a complainer? So we need to check ourselves. Do we fit? any of this. So, we've been we've been swinging the sword for a minute. So we're going to we're going to switch gears and we're going to start hugging a little bit. So, the second half is is far less fighty. So now we're going to move from contending to remembering. I know it's like the greatest subtitle ever. But you, dear friends, remember what was predicted by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ in 17 and then 18. They told you in the end time, there will be scoffers walking according to their own ungodly desires. Again, God is not taken by surprise by any of this. For some reason, we tend to be like we haven't been told, but we were told that as we round the last corner of this world, people will just openly mock God and good things. To us, those who love God, it's as if while breathing air, they stand there laughing at breathing air. You guys are stupid. Look at you standing there breathing your air. I can't even believe you believe in breathing. Then he says, these are the ones who cause division. So I need somebody to write that down on a billboard 
write it in the sky, carve it on the moon. It is not the guys that have been preaching what we have been preaching for 2,000 years that are causing divisions. It is the people who are moving the goalposts that are causing divisions, changing primary doctrine because they don't like the way it feels. And Baptists. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But that's what it says. They attack the integrity of Scripture, of the church, of its members. They attack God. Remember, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? So it's worldly-minded mockers of God who bring in true division. And then he points out, they are devoid of spirit. So Lauren and I found ourselves in a server called Rapture something or other. Maybe it was just Rapture. Lauren was boldly engaging with these people. She was proclaiming the word of God to them. They were calling her to repent because she didn't have the spirit. They were calling her unsaved because she used too much scripture, not enough experience and emotion. Guess where their arguments came from? from dreams, from emotion, and from opinions. So after leaving there originally, I was comfortable with saying that these men were just in error and confused brothers. Now after seeing what June has to say, I am sadly confident that these men fit the profile of false teachers as Jude has laid out before all of us. The blackness of darkness reserved for them Pray, church, for the repentance of the people connected to that server. When it clicked for the, when it clicked for me, these men and the position that they find themselves in, my heart hurt, and I was reminded of something Spurgeon said. If sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped about their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions, and let not one go unwarned and unprayed for. Pray for those guys. Verse 20, but you, dear friends, as you build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, expecting the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life. So we get reminded these people are coming in. They will come in. They have come in, and they're here. Fight for the faith. Remember what you've been told, and remember this is not new. And then find the love of God and go bathe in it. Roll around in it. Wrap yourself up in it. Our Christian life can never stand still. Standing still as a Christian is to go backward. Don't believe me? Don't pray or read scripture or devotions or go to church or any other spiritual discipline for one week. Don't actually do this. You don't need to actually do this. Because if we're being honest, you and I have actually done this. You didn't just pause where you were like a video game. No forward movement is always backward movement for us. Apostates tear down and destroy as their father does. We, brothers and sisters, are builders. We must build up our spiritual life, then that of our church community. We must always be moving forward. We must be moving forward on a strong foundation, and, on our, and our foundation is Christ and our most holy faith he has given us. Keep yourself in the love of God. Stay in his word, practicing grace, keeping your hands to the plow, contending earnestly for the faith, waiting expectantly for the mercy of God and mercy from him alone, because you will not be given mercy from this world. Any mercy you receive is from God and God alone, because all good things come from God. So it says, wait on God and have mercy on those who are doubting. 
they aren't trying to be rebellious, guys. They're just falling into the trap. So gracefully and kindly help them. Don't beat them up. Help them. This kind of ministry requires a great deal of love and patience. They're believers, but they're weak ones with no biblical grounding in what they believe beyond, well, I, I've got John 3.16 memorized, and I know I love Jesus. Be kind to them. If you walk away from what I've said today with dragon's fire on your breath about contending for the faith, and that alone, I have failed. Because contending for the faith is more than arguing against false teaching. It's lifting up the brothers and sisters. Be merciful kind and loving. Give them the help you were given as an unbeliever or a wavering new believer, not being sure which way is doctrinally up. Genesis 19.16 tells us that the angels led out of Sodom and Gomorrah Lot, and we need to save others by snatching them out of the fire in a like manner as we see in verse 23. But I want you to understand something about this. It's a fire. You're reaching into it. Brothers and sisters, I want you to understand the imagery here. You're reaching into a fire, which means you may get burned, but that is no excuse not to reach out. You've been burned before. That is no excuse not to reach out. The other half of verse 23 in the CSB says, with fear. The idea here is, with caution. In trying to help those that have erred, we must be careful not to be trapped ourselves. When I did water rescue, you had to be cautious approaching someone who was in danger because the panic that they were in could drag you down. Then everybody drowns. With fear do we rescue hating everything sinful, even the clothes that represent sin. The principle here is the stronger believer must never assume he is beyond falling for a false doctrine. Stand strong and contend for the faith. Do so with grace, mercy, faith, and fear. Now, to the best part of this entire letter, and for you guys probably just because you're tired of hearing me talk, the benediction, verses 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless and with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen and amen. These two verses contain a wealth of spiritual truth for us. If we want to keep our feet on the ground spiritually, we walk upright and not stumble, then we must yield ourselves fully to Jesus. He alone is able to guard us. Jude was not writing about the possibility of the believer sinning and falling away from God's family. If we remember, the beloved is kept by God. In regard to the believer, he is talking about our daily walk with the Lord and the dangers of stumbling and falling into sin and staying there. Our Father will never permit one of his own to be lost. The Father has covenanted with the Son that we would one day see and share in his glory in John 17. One day very soon, there will be no more spots or blemishes on the church. That's you and me if you had to figure it out. On that day, God's people, us, we, you, me, all of us, the bride of Christ will be blameless, and Satan can open his mouth no more. We, the bride, will be standing in the righteousness of Christ to the glory of our everlasting Father. Think on this the next time temptation comes your way. Think on this the next time you have doubt. And think on this the next time you fall into sin. Why should I repent? Why should I walk in the way of God? so that Jesus might receive glory. 
Brothers and sisters, the next time you have doubt, you sin, or you have trouble in this world, I want you to say this to yourself. As a matter of fact, I want you to say it now, out loud. I don't care where you are. And no, this is not some silly altar call, but I want you to do this so you recognize something. Say this. I do these things so that my Jesus might receive glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the word you've given us. We thank you for the time you've given us to be in it, to discuss it, to learn more about you and the things and principles and practices we need to follow through with. Lord, we pray that the church grows from this, that the people of these servers, they see more of you, they love more of you, and they grow in your grace and knowledge. Lord, we thank you, we love you, and we cannot live without you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.